continue. Okay, so this one's all about thermochemistry. And now we're finally getting to the point in the quarter where we um, go a little bit deeper in on the topic rather than doing kind of the overview, which I feel like the first four chapters are, which are just kind of like, let's get the basic language of chemistry so that way we can do some labs, honestly. Um, and so in this one, we're gonna be focusing on energy and heat transfer. And we'll come back and we'll do more work on this general topic when we talk about thermodynamics. Um, and we're not gonna do that until we get into the last class of the series, because um, we're gonna need some other ideas to help us talk about that. So this is kind of setting the ground work for thinking about how heat flows from a system to a surroundings, thinking about exothermic and endothermic reactions, and um, introducing the idea of enthalpy. Um, and so this is like this whole chapter, it's really like the story of enthalpy, which is uh, the change in enthalpy we do delta H. And then we'll build this enthalpy information into a bigger story about entropy and free energy and the spontaneity of reactions um, later on. So, um, but this will be helpful as we talk about things like uh, intermolecular forces next quarter. So uh, the beginning of this chapter and kind of the, the beginning is really about like what is energy and doing a brief overview of that. Um, although I, I would say that like at no point do we say energy is this and give this like really clear definition. And that's because energy isn't like this piece of matter that can be like, look, see the thing? like. And, and I, maybe this is me kind of oversharing how my brain just kind of like struggles to wrap around things that I can't actually physically hold like actual matter. Um, and that's kind of a fun process, but anyway. Um, so when we talk about energy and this is gonna touch kind of on our physics classes, uh, we've got potential energy and kinetic energy. And within this kinetic energy, this is really how mo molecules move. And so, this is going to be uh, translational, rotational, vibrational motion of our atoms and our molecules. Um, and it's, uh, so this is like movement. And it's also gonna be our thermal energy as well. Uh, and so as we increase the, the, the amount of thermal energy a system has, it's gonna have more movement. These are gonna be proportional to one another. And then our potential energy is really gonna be our stored energy and chemical bonds. And you might hear this called chemical energy instead. Um, and so there, these are like larger umbrella terms and we're gonna focus in on specific things within kinetic energy and within potential energy. And you can get a broader treatment of these topics in a physics class. Um, but we're gonna focus on how it applies to little molecules. Um, so a few things to take away from the general, general one that I would like to highlight uh, is that kinetic energy is gonna be proportional to temperature. And we'll come back to that throughout this class and the entire series. Um, yeah, and then, Sorry, I'm scanning my notes while also doing this to be like, what are the important things in my overly detailed notes? Um, in terms of energy too, we really consider this just that capacity to do work. And doing work is like moving an object, right? Or changing something. Um, and you would transfer energy, like if I was gonna, push a chair, I would transfer energy to the chair to like give it translational kinetic energy, like motion. Um, and we will focus a little bit on what this definition of work is. However, in chemistry, uh, we don't think about like pushing a little tiny molecule with our finger. The type of work that we focus on more is pressure volume work, which is when a gas is going to, if it, a gas like expands, like if I do a chemical reaction that produces a gas, it's gonna bubble and it's gonna start filling up the air around me and it'll dissipate. Well, the creation of that gas expands up against the surroundings, which is like the atmosphere gas. And that is gonna do work. Cause it's like the gas is pushing the other gas away. 
or if uh, gas is consumed in a reaction, like it uses oxygen from the air in the chemical reaction, then the surroundings are going to kind of push that gas into the uh, reaction. And so it's gonna do work in that direction. Um, and we haven't talked about gases yet. We'll do that in chapter nine. So we'll focus a little bit less on that. There's some stuff in the lectures about it, but there'll be less in the homework. So uh, let's focus on, I guess before let's talk about energy transfer and let's talk about energy units. The other big takeaway about energy is that, whoops, it can't be destroyed or created. So it's just gonna be transferred around. Um, so it's gonna transfer through motion and heat and light. So we're always going to have to put things in terms of like in the context. So we always have a system, like we can describe lots of different systems, like my body is a system or this like mouse is a system and its surroundings. And that's going to be the things immediately around that system. And then kind of outside it, the surroundings is we have kind of the idea of the whole universe. And so we aren't going to create or destroy energy within the universe. This is going to remain constant. But energy can change within a system and the surroundings. And it's going to do that by transferring back and forth. And so we can have energy transfer from a system to the surroundings. Um, or we can have it go from the surroundings into the system. So that, that flow of energy, we usually see in chemistry as heat flow um, and a shift from one system to something else around it. And the system is what you define it, right? So um, if I am holding a hot cup of coffee, right? This is like the classic example. Um, so I'm holding a cup of coffee. The coffee is hot. My hand is at body temperature. And so my hand is the surroundings to the coffee and heat will transfer spontaneously from the coffee to my hand. Over time, they're gonna come to the same temperature. And my hand, the surroundings and the air around it are gonna keep absorbing energy, heat from the hot coffee until we hit thermal equilibrium. I'm going to write that there. Um, but I'm defining the hot coffee as the system there, right? So I could instead define myself as the system and I've got hot coffee touching my hand through this cup. And, um, I am going to absorb heat from that hot coffee into the system. And so if I define myself as the system, I'm absorbing heat, heat's flowing into the system. If I define the coffee as a system, heat is flowing out, it is leaving the system. Um, so that can kind of get a little tricky, especially with some of these problems. So it's always like do a double check on context, like what's my system, what's my surroundings. Um, and if you tend to flip things in your head, like I do, that's a thing you're going to have to like really work on actually slowing down and being like, wait, what's the system? So there's that. Um, so, and, and we'll get lots of practice with thinking about the direction heat flows. We also have uh, units to track for energy. And we've done lots of work with dimensional analysis. So uh, we're giving you some new units and you're gonna have to use them in dimensional analysis to kind of help solve problems. So you're gonna have a joule, one joule equals a kilogram meter squared over a second squared. And it's a measurement of energy. Um, but we also use calories. One calorie equals 4.184 joules. Um, we also have one kilowatt hour. I think it's that, that's the abbreviation. Um, or is it like that? Sorry, uh, which is 3.60 times 10 to the sixth joule. So it's lots of them. So be prepared to do conversions with these. 
I'll point out that, uh, can you still hear me? Yeah. All right. Yes. Good, that was doing a weird thing. I got a weird error message. So this calorie thing right here, just like to be super aware, one, one calorie with a capital C, this is so stupid, is really one kilocalorie, which is like 1000 calories. And this is a nutritional calorie, this big C1. So when we talk about having a 100 calorie snack, we're actually talking about a 100 kilocalorie snack. So we're really talking about a 100,000 calorie snack. And because we differentiate it in the US with just this capital C versus lowercase c, which is like impossible to distinguish in most people's handwriting, um, it can get really confusing. And so I just like point it out as this really annoying thing. Um, so there's that. Uh, so we'll use these. Um, and there's gonna be a few problems that just like make you play around with those to get used to them. Um, so in terms of thermochemistry and thermodynamics, um, we're gonna get a few of the laws of thermodynamics in this chapter. And we've already discussed the first law, which is this energy is constant in the universe. So this is the first law of thermodynamics. And then we're going to essentially be looking at first phase diagrams within this chapter and like what internal energy changes are. And then we're gonna look at calculating heat. Let's, let's do this. Um, so we've got, uh, and We'll calculate heat, and then we're going to spend a lot of time on that heat transfer. And so with this piece, that's when we're going to start thinking about calorimeters. You can also talk a little bit about pressure volume work as well. So we'll talk about bomb calorimeters, and we'll talk about coffee cup calorimeters. And then in this discussion, we're going to need to talk about uh, enthalpy. And we'll introduce that. And so that's that H symbol. We'll actually introduce it here for reaction diagrams too. But we'll talk about the different ways of calculating this. Um, and we'll give you a few different methods. I think we give you three, so which is kind of annoying in and of itself. But we're gonna have Hess's law that we talk about um, standard formation, standard enthalpies of formation. And then you can always calculate it from information about, um, from calorimetry. So we'll have like kind of three calculations that you do with enthalpy. And that will kind of round out our chapter on this. Um, so I'll start with reaction diagrams and then take a pause to see if there's any questions at that point. Um, so, or energy diagrams, that's what I've been going for. Those are the words. So in terms of energy diagrams, really it's just kind of a way of tracking how heat transfers. Um, and one of the big ideas is that the chemical reaction is the system. We can define the system however we want. So as chemists, we're gonna say like, well, let's just take the molecules that are participating in a chemical change and define those as the system. Uh, and then the surroundings can be things like the solvent that dissolves them if they're in like a, an aqueous solution or they are in a mixture and there are some things that aren't participating in the reaction. The container, the air around it, things like that. So anything surrounding the chemicals that are undergoing a transformation. Um, and so if we set these kind of ideas and we think about an energy scale of lower or higher overall energy, so like potential energy and kinetic energy. And a lot of times 
we think about this actually as just the potential energy, like the stored energy within the bonds. Um, and sometimes you'll see kind of a, a larger kind of broader take on just energy. Um, but what we can see is there's like really two different possibilities. Either your reactants in your reaction are at a lower potential energy than the products of a reaction, or they were originally at a higher potential energy. And this is really defined by the uh, stored energy in the bonds. And so as a transformation takes place, as your reactants change and become products, we either need to have energy put into the system or energy will be released from the system as the reaction progresses. And so in the case where, oh, wrong way. Mm -hmm where our reactants are at a higher energy um, and they are going to form products at a lower energy, it'll have this excess energy that was used, that, that was in the reactants that the products don't have. And so it's just going to be given off as heat. And so you're gonna have heat released. These reactants at a higher energy, it, it means that they're less stable than the products. Whereas in the kind of counterpoint, our products, when they're at the higher energy, they're less stable than the reactants. And for our reactants then to become something that's less stable, it's going to need to have more energy kind of stored in those bonds. So it's gonna to have to pull in energy from the surroundings. So it's going to absorb heat. And these are kind of like the two possibilities of how a chemical reaction will take place. It's either going to need to release heat into its surroundings, or it's gonna to have to steal heat from the surroundings to be able to make the reaction happen. And we've got names for them, of course, right? So we have endothermic. That is when it has to absorb heat from the surroundings for the reaction to take place. If, if you were holding this reaction in your hand, right? Like if it was a solid that was undergoing the reaction, or if you were, um, holding a coffee cup that had the reaction taking place in a solvent, this would feel like it was getting colder because it's taking the energy from your hands. Uh, so something that where the reactants are less stable than the products, this we call exothermic. Um, and it's gonna feel like it's getting hotter. And these exothermic reactions are associated with an enthalpy, which is really like how heat flows, an enthalpy that's positive and, um, I'm sorry, negative, because it's losing it. See, I flip things. And endothermic reactions are associated with an enthalpy that's positive. And so we usually try to, like, we'll, we'll distinguish whether a reaction's endothermic or exothermic because an endothermic reaction we could speed up by adding more heat um, or like we'll be able to form more products. An exothermic reaction, we should need to be prepared for it to generate heat. Um, and so that might form, like it may cause it to boil or something like that. Um, and it allows us to also harness things. Like if we need a reaction to produce energy, like, like combusting gasoline in our car, we want it to make energy to run the car. It's gonna be an exothermic reaction. Um, all right, I'm gonna pause here. Hold on. So um, let's talk about heat a little bit more and change in energy. So. Um, as the energy of a system changes, the internal energy, it's really changing the um, amount of heat in the system and the amount of work that the system is being, is doing or is being done. Um, and so this work piece that we'll see in the our class is really just going to be, where to go? Uh, so work is equal to force over distance uh, and, for us, it's really gonna be then, we can do a derivation that's in the lectures. The negative of the external pressure 
times the change in volume. So it's like pushing down or it's expanding out. Um, the part we're gonna focus on is chemists because not all reactions produce a gas. And a lot of what we do is are things that just like occur in a solution. So the work component is really small compared to how heat changes in a reaction. And so most of the change in energy of, um, that we focus on in chemistry is really about heat flow. And so we really care about this Q, which is heat. We care about it so much that we oftentimes estimate the change in energy with just the change in heat and ignore work quite a bit, um, which is kind of like our you know, estimating. And that's really what enthalpy is, actually. Enthalpy ends up really being that change in heat. Where did I put it? So that's a second, I guess. Um, so let's talk more about what, how to calculus, calculate this. So we think of heat basically as a change in temperature, right? Like heat will flow from the coffee into my hand and I will have a positive change in temperature on my hand and a negative change in temperature on the hot coffee. And so that's what this Q is. It's proportional to that change in temperature. Um, and the amount of change in that temperature really depends on the matter that we're talking about, like the objects and um, like everything from like their chemical composition, like how their bonds are structured. And so we can set Q equal to that change in temperature if we also take into account something called C, which is the heat capacity. It's gonna have, uh, it's really like how much heat does the, is required to increase the temperature of the system by one degree. Mm -hmm. And we have kind of a couple different things within this. We also have um, specific heat. Um, so we would say the specific heat times the delta T is then going to be uh, also times mass because CS specific heat. It's the same thing, it's, it's C per gram of mass, right? So we can be like, well, based on how much we have too. Um, and then we also have molar heat too. We can calculate heat if we know the number of moles and we know the molar heat, which is C N. Ooh. I forget my subscript right now off the top of my head. So this one's just gonna be per mole instead. Um, the one we're gonna use the most, and you might have seen already, is this idea that, of using specific heat. Um, so when you look up the specific heat or like the heat capacity of the material, you usually see it listed as specific heat. So it's based on the actual amount that you have. Um, so we can look at this even more and think about heat transfer specifically. Um, and so if we have heat spontaneously moving from a system to a surroundings or surrounding to system, it's always gonna flow where there's less heat, right? Um, we can say that any heat that's lost by a system is going to be gained by, or will be the opposite of the surroundings. So this is like the equation way of writing, anything that the system loses, the surroundings gain, or anything the surroundings gain, or lose the system gains. So the amount of heat lost is what will be gained on the other side. And so the, you just say it's the negative essentially. So that gives us a lot of power to think about how heat transfers in systems. And this allows us to do a lot of calculations that you'll get lots of practice with in the homework where we use this equation um, of specific heat and we use this idea that heat will transfer completely between system and surroundings to solve things like, oh, what will be the final temperature of a system if we add things that are at different heats? And we'll solve this by essentially putting those specific heat um, equations equal to each other. So we'll do this heat calculation for the system will be equal to the mass times the specific heat times the change in temperature for the surroundings. And what you'll typically see is your masses will be different 
and your specific heats will be different because it'll be different for the surroundings versus the system. And then our change in temperature is always gonna be our final temperature minus our initial temperature. And so usually you'll have the final temperature will be the same. When the final temperature is the same, that's when you've reached thermal equilibrium. And I know we haven't talked about equilibrium yet, but it just means that everything's at the same temperature. So there'll be a fun series of calculations you get to do with this. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna pause there before talking about calorimetry. So then uh, once you kind of get past these, it's really about um, like the rest of what we're doing is calorimetry and calculating enthalpy, which is that H symbol. Um, and enthalpy or like the change in enthalpy is kind of like the change in energy for a system without considering the work. And so it's a way of us approximating changes in energy just looking at the heat because it's what is going to dominate that equation anyway. Um, so for bomb calorimetry, we control the volume and keep that constant. And so because of that, the change in energy for the reaction is just going to be the change in the heat. So when you control the volume and make it constant, no work can be done. So that change in energy for the reaction is going to equal uh, Q, uh, that heat, instead of heat plus work only. So um, in this case, then, the, the equation you'll use to solve for them is you'll figure out the heat of the calorimeter. That'll be your surroundings. Um, and that'll be equal to a heat capacity for the calorimeter times the change in temperature. And that'll be equal to the negative, the heat of the reaction. And so you can use this equation and whatever info is given to get to that heat of the reaction, which is usually what we're curious about because that heat of the reaction is gonna be equal to the uh, change in energy for the reaction. And it'll be like, it's exothermic or it's endothermic. Um, <laughs> uh, we're gonna call the enthalpy of the reaction, I'll highlight that here, is going to usually be in units of like kilojoules per mole. And so it's really that heat of the reaction uh, for the moles, for one mole of the reaction. So we'll bring back some stoichiometry calculations here and play with them. If we know that enthalpy for the reaction, we can figure out like how much energy in kilojoules that'll be generated for like five grams of octane reacting. And so we'll use that information there. The other type of calorimetry that we have is coffee cup calorimetry. And this is basically what we'll be doing in our lab. Um, and so in this one, we don't hold volume constant. Instead, we hold pressure constant by having it open to the atmosphere. Therefore, no work will be done. And this is usually how we calculate enthalpy. This is what we'll be doing in the lab. We'll calculate enthalpy this way, where we'll have the enthalpy of the reaction is really then just equal to the heat of the reaction because we're not doing work, right? Um, and that'll be equal to the negative of the heat of the solution, which we can measure with just a thermometer. We're like, how much does the water around the chemical reaction change in temperature? Um, so we'll have the mass of our solution times the specific heat of our solution times the change in temperature. And we'll use this to calculate um, that enthalpy of a reaction, which allows us to approximate the change in energy for the reaction. Uh, so these are like the experimental ways of doing this, of calculating enthalpy. Um, and then we have some kind of, some ways of doing it that, that don't require like an actual chemical 
are like going into the lab to perform a chemical reaction. The first one is Hess's law, um, which means that, uh, so we'll have uh, for chemical reactions, we'll have a table that reports um, enthalpies of reaction that people have measured in the past. And so like you can look up the enthalpy of reaction for octane, right, combusting for in a car. And I know I keep coming to that reaction because it's the one stuck in my head. Um, and so for Hess's law, what you can do is you can manipulate chemical reactions and then take the sum of their enthalpies of reaction to predict the enthalpy of reaction for a different one. Um, and there's like a set of rules for that that you can practice. Um, if the reaction is multiplied by a value, so is the enthalpy. If you flip the reaction, then you multiply uh, the enthalpy of reaction by negative one. So if you make the products, the reactants and the reactants, the products. Um, and then you can just take the sum And what you're really doing is you're taking other reactions that if you flip them or multiply them and then you add them all up, things will cancel out. Like if you cancel out the same reactant and product on each side, like if you have uh, water on both sides, you cancel it out. Um, just like you would in an algebraic expression. Then uh, you can, if you can get to something that looks exactly like the reaction you're interested in, you can sum up the changes to the enthalpies of reaction, take the sum and that'll be the enthalpy of reaction for the one you're interested in. And so it's really just like algebra for enthalpy. If you like word puzzles and things like that and little math puzzles, it'll be a lot of fun for you. And if you hate that, it's not gonna be a lot of fun for you. And there's one more way to calculate it from a pile of tables and it's the standard enthalpy of formation. Um, so we have tables that um, of measurements of like how much heat was transferred or what's the enthalpy of like oxygen being oxygen from like elemental oxygen, right? So like an oxygen atom becoming oxygen gas, O2 and things like that. Um, and so these are all gonna be, we call it a standard state. So they're all gonna be at the same temperature and pressure. Um, and we can use these to calculate it, a standard enthalpy of reaction. And we use this little degree symbol to mean standard. So it's like under these super specific conditions, you can calculate the enthalpy by adding up like the enthalpies of formation of all the reactants and products that are in the chemical reaction. And so it's like you would take the sum of all the enthalpies of formation for your products, multiply them by their coefficients that are in the balanced reaction. Um, and then subtract the sum of those enthalpies of formation for all the reactants. Again, multiply them by their coefficients in the balanced reaction too. And that'll allow you to approximate the standard enthalpy of reaction. So you'll have like basically four ways of calculating it at the end of the day or three ways. Um, and we'll have you get comfortable with that. And this Hess's law style thing, we'll use it again later. Um, and in your lab, you'll have a couple of reactions that you do and you should be able to then uh, use Hess's law also to like get something similar. Um, so that'll be kind of like, hopefully a nice demonstration of the concept, make it a little bit more realistic. And that is my summary. So I'll pause and stop for